Welcome to your 2013 Legislative Breakfast. Pledge 
all over the country not to leave anybody behind. Some of us have a personal obligation to that phrase. I will not leave anybody behind. I hope some of you would embrace that yourself, but the serious part is we have this great public policy. And how are you going to do this? You're going to do it by in communities led by people who are representative of that community themselves as volunteers who have a board of directors. And that leadership has been sustained in that in four and a half decades. Now we're approaching four and a half decades. We always commend those volunteers. And today we have two of our board members uh, present. Mr. Haru Karoyla uh, on our board has been on board the passport session. extraordinary leadership. The leadership in developmental services have enjoyed persons within the legislature, including and beginning with, way before that, before Mr. Um, you know, Aladdin, uh, people who understood, as soon as they met, folks that are gathered in this room, and tens of thousands of you throughout the state, that this was an important direction in public policy. And with us uh, today are, are, are great leaders who are reflective of that. I want you to, and we'll introduce them more thoroughly in a few minutes. Senator Bill Monning, right here. <laughs> Senator Mark Stone. <laughs> and we know uh, Luis Alejo, Assemblymember Alejo, is on his way somewhere. It's a very busy time for all. Right along with good citizen governance, we have every branch of it. Mr. Stone, who is a, a past a Board of Supervisors. And we're lucky today to have with us Zach Friend, Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisor. And Zach, you are really close by somewhere. I guess he just stepped out. Oh, OK. My timing is impeccable. <laughs> if you don't know who Zach Friend is, you haven't lived in this geographic area very long. He's a terrific guy. We're really happy to be here. With our legislators, our staff, that um, they'll be the first to say how you get your business done, right, gentlemen? Um, it's this extraordinary staff. Some of you have been blessed with continuity of staff, and it even makes it even more, uh, a bit, even more better, as my sister would say, more better, uh, and, and meeting so many people. And so, uh, staff here today, um, representing uh, Senator uh, Canella, is Bill Riggs. Uh, Bill is right here. Good morning, Adam. Everybody knows Adam Spencer. <laughs> Gabrielle. Gabrielle Washington. And the next thing have uh, Assemblymember Stone is Paige Aguero. Um, I want to draw your attention real quickly to on the front of this. Um, nice little program. You'll see an oak tree. If you look at closely at the oak tree itself, there's a shadow of that oak tree. And that, and that shadow of that oak tree is a representation of the four counties that San Andreas Regional Center represents. Santa Clara, Monterey, Santa Cruz, and San Benito counties. Um, right now, 15,000 people in those four counties have served through this great piece of civil rights legislation. Uh, we, our board, and all of us who are staff here, are proud, we think, of the opportunity to provide a service, and every day you tell us how we're doing. And oh boy, do you tell us how we're doing. You never miss an opportunity. So this program today uh, talks about that, and remembering us, and remembering the individual stories that you will hear today. That's the notion of remember me. And then, as you hear those stories, we ask you, uh, with this little other button, I will remember, a pledge, that you will remember this story. And you will have the opportunity to repeat those stories from your head and from your heart, we hope the most, from your heart. It all comes from your heart. It always comes from your heart. So it's my pleasure uh, now to, to introduce, uh, let's see, Francisco Valenzuela. Oh, Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. You know, before we start, I want to 
give thanks to everyone who showed, but also the committee who helped put this together. For those of you who were on SPAC and Senator staff, please raise your hands to everybody, those who was responsible. For On March 6th, uh, San Andreas had a group of individuals, parents, providers, uh, consumers attend Grassroots Day each year. The Associational Regional Center Agency hosts uh, Grassroots Day where they invite all the regional centers to come out and speak to their legislators. Uh, we were fortunate to actually have the largest contingency, and we we're very fortunate to have Mike and Toby and Jared. Why don't you guys stand real quick? There are video guys. You guys are You know, Toby is not shy. Um, <laughs> so if you want to be interviewed, Toby will interview you. Just don't go to the bathroom because he will try to interview you. <laughs> um, but we we're fortunate to have them with us because we're able to capture what happened in Sacramento. And every year when we go to Sacramento, we talk to the legislators, we talk to their staff. Unfortunately, not everybody in our communities can come with us, and so what we did is we found a way to bring those messages back. Unfortunately, we couldn't put the whole, I don't know how much time was on there, Mike, maybe hour and a half, hour and a half of yeah. interviews. Um, so we kind of put it in six minutes. So if you got cut out, I'm sorry, or we didn't pay enough. It's either or. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, you didn't cast the checks, right? The checks are clear, and we're good. But no, it's been really, it's very, we're very fortunate to have a very supportive four counties of representatives, people that come from Santa Clara, San Benito, Monterey, Santa Cruz, who travel to Sacramento on behalf of all the people served in San Andreas Regional Center. San Andreas is serving over 13,000 individuals with developmental disabilities, um, all the different programs and the staff. This group right here is a small sample of that group. <coughs> then we'll do it again next week in San Jose. We'll, right now we're at 350 people registered. We'll probably go up to four. We've had up to five uh, in that in that breakfast. Uh, but again, thank you for being here. Uh, the, again, the video is a, a, is a snapshot of what we were able to capture in Sacramento. And again, the reason we go to Sacramento is on behalf of everyone here. They're speaking on your behalf, and we're very fortunate to have some supportive legislators who welcome us, walk us, us into their offices. And in some cases, not enough room to stand sit because it's just so many of us. Uh, so with that, Mike, please. Uh, Take it away. Welcome to your 2013 Legislative Breakfast. We are at, at the ARCA Grassroot Days at the Capitol. Why are you here for Grassroot Days? This is uh, my second year here at, uh, to come for Grassroots Day. I really enjoyed it last year, uh, coming to uh, speak with the state senators and state assembly members, and I uh, learned a, lo a lot of interesting stuff uh, last year, and I'm hoping to learn more this year. Uh, what's more important about today? Well, today, what's really important about it, it's an opportunity for people to connect to their legislators. Sometimes it really helps for them to see the, the human side of what they deal with. I've been doing this approximately nine years now, but today is a very special day for me. My grandson has been diagnosed with speech delay. He's two and a half years old. He doesn't speak yet or anything. and. Now is the time to try to do whatever I can on a personal level now. Mark, Stone, Assembly Member, 29, District. This is my son, Joel. Um, he's 10 years old and he struggles with autism. Uh, he was nonverbal for many years. He couldn't communicate tell me his needs or wants, I was basically had to mind read him. And um, 
we've struggled for years trying to get him services. And um, I don't know if you know how that feels when you have a child who cannot tell you how he feels or what happened in school, but it's, it's devastating. And because of the regional center, he was able to get earlier intervention services, or like speech therapy, and today he's able to communicate with me and talk in sentences. Because of those early intervention services, um, it gave him a quality of life. We don't recognize the cuts that happened and how that safety net is really frayed and the level of services is really frayed. That I think we do ourselves a great disservice as we try to understand what to do next. Yeah, thank you so much for listening to my story. Just remember Yoel and other children like him and parents like myself that um, need so many services to stay intact um, so that he can thrive and his potential can come out. So why is more important about helping your people? That with the budget cuts that have been happening, I think there's more acute awareness that it's our responsibility to stand up for folks who typically don't have a voice and aren't able to come and articulate their needs like you are here today. So people with disabilities, our kids, our seniors, they need special attention and we need to make sure that we're there for them. Does it, do you feel honored? I am absolutely honored to be here. I'm excited. I walk into this building and you see the building. I walk up every morning and look up and think, wow, I get to work here. It's exciting. Um, how do you feel that uh, when I first voted you? <laughs> I, I can't be here without the good graces of the voters in, in the district. And, uh, I, it, it's a tremendous responsibility and I meet that responsibility with a great deal of pride and, and I understand that I need to deliver and, and be there for you. The Regional Center wants to present this to you uh, for your continued friendship, support, legislative leadership for individuals with developmental disabilities. And this is um, all for all your efforts and the support that we do receive and that you. we count on. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. I, I'm a very strong supporter of the developmentally disabled community and uh, this really acknowledges that and I'm going to be showing it off. My name is Maya Bereket and I'm from Hope Services and I'm a, also a client advocate. And I feel great that I can actually have enough money to get my own apartment, so please, I am not a budget cut. We look forward to seeing that money uh, being brought back to make the regional centers whole again, to make the providers whole again, and to bring lives whole again.
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'd like to start out with asking all of you a question. My question is, who is the most important person in this room? I want you to just ponder that thought. And I'm going to tell you a short little story because we have a lot of stories to share today. Jim Velasco is the author of the book called Teaching Elephants to Dance. And he was following a very um, renowned and famous heart surgeon, Dr. Denton Cooley. And so Velasco was following him around the operating room, to the hospital, to the operating room, and Dr. Cooley stopped to talk to a gentleman who was holding a mop. And he spoke with him for quite some time, and then he rushed into the operating room. So Velasco went to the gentleman, and he said, um, that was a long time to be talking. And the gentleman said, yes, Dr. Cooley and I talk quite often. And he said, well, to the gentleman, what is it that you do here at the hospital? And the gentleman replied, we save lives. So all of us here today, providers, families, the clients themselves, we're all involved with saving lives. And especially San Andreas Regional Center and all the hard work that our service coordinators do to help us save those lives. Following up on what Sandy was saying about remember me, I have a couple little things that I'd like to say throughout the course of the day and try to remember me. And these are based on real people that I know. The first one would be, remember me. I'm a service provider who provides daily services, involvement, and encouragement. Remember me, I'm the young man who walks with a walker because I have cerebral palsy in Down syndrome. So now I'd like to introduce you those who do for others. And our first person is Dr. Heidi Morgan. I'll give you a little bit of her background. Heidi is celebrating 21 years in the field of developmental disabilities. Heidi owns and operates four homes in Santa Cruz. She works as a board-certified behavior analyst in Santa Cruz and Santa Clara area counties. Heidi is an international speaker in California, Hawaii, and the Caribbean. I received the San Andreas Regional Center's Service Above Self Awards in October 2012. She describes herself as a wife, a mom, and even a grandma, with a passion for photojournalistic photography. I was a little bit of a tongue twister now. So please welcome Dr. Heidi Morgan. to make the choice to serve people with disabilities. 
in this grassroots process, I was able to meet families and parents at the table I'm sitting with today. Jeanette and Michelle are surrounding me. And in their story, I hear all it took to help their children to talk, to ask for the things that they want. And so we spent a lot of time giving voices to our children, and the budget is required in order to hear that voice and to honor them. And these pieces that, that contribute to quality of life are not accidental. When you have a developmental disability, quality of life is not an accident, and it does take a village to meet every milestone and every goal, and that's what our job is. I ask that you not just remember the consumers that we serve, I ask that you think about the staff. Today, speaking of consumers, uh, you'll hear a little bit about one specific person's story. We selected two persons from our agency to bring with us and part of their staff teams. Uh, one person whose name will not go mentioned, but I have permission to share with you, is a very special success. For the first time in our agency, we have exited a person from hospice.
My parents noticed when I was a little bit bigger that there was something not right about me. My doctor at the time was telling my parents that I will catch up. My parents did not believe the doctor and got a second opinion. I didn't crawl, talk, or eat with a fork or spoon by myself. My doctor at the time referred me to a special preschool that taught me all that I know today. At seven months old, my doctor referred me to the regional center and they accepted me as an unknown disability. Today, they still do not know what my disability is. Last year, we finally went back to see the professionals to see if they could tell us what my diagnosis is, diagnosis is but they failed to find a cause. But that doesn't stop me from who I am today. I am advocating to save the San Andreas Regional Center. My SARC worker provides me with my job coaching at my outside job with Las Colinas, as well as my host Deanne's a computer class, poetry class, and action club that I am currently learning about leadership skills. My instructor, Monica, teaches me new skills on the computer, such as creating a PowerPoint, learning to use a memory stick, and making a cartoon of myself. In my poetry class, we learn how to express ourselves. If you go to www.youtube.com and look up George Nim and Red Beats, you will see a cartoon of one of our poems that we created in our class. We even made a CD for children as well. We also have published a few poetry books from our poems. Last year, I was president of my action club and got to lead all the meetings. This wouldn't be possible without the funding from the regional center. Please help us by saving our funding. Remember me, it means that I count.
changes often. And what I remember and I reflect on is um, I read a book, Who Moved My Cheese? And if you remember that book, things change often, and that's what happened to me. So I thought I had a handle on it, and um, my cheese continued to move. And um, it wasn't until Anthony was in high school where I was introduced and um, um, encouraged to sign up for um, SARC. I had no idea the services that they offered, and at that time, I felt that I needed medication myself, and maybe I was going to be along the bedside with my son. And um, Sark, I can't tell you how much they have helped me and my son. Um, in high school, you know, children, teenagers, I mean, I have two older daughters that are teenagers. Thank goodness I got through that, okay? Um, <laughs> But, you know, with the child with disabilities, there's a lot more challenges because daily things change for you. Um, every day you remind them you need to brush your teeth, you need to put your pants on, you need to shower at night. Every day is a reminder to them. When I started with SARC, um, it came a time where um, Anthony certainly had his IEP from school. And those meetings were certainly interesting when you're alone. At that time, I was assigned to a wonderful case manager, Ruby Saunders. I don't know if she's here, but she was wonderful. Understanding my son, his needs, and now partnering with me, going along with the IEPs with the school meetings, um, was wonderful. Um, she came along, um, assisted me with services that I didn't know that we had you know, available to us. Um, things changed, and Anthony um, um, needed to have additional services in high school and going to um, the off-campus high school um, that I didn't know was uh, available to us, which was Beacon at that time. So we had different, you know, struggles in high school. After Beacon, um, the post-senior program, again, I didn't know that I had, you know, resources offered to us. Um, he attended Beyond Potential, a wonderful facility, and then currently at Bayside. Right now, Anthony um, lives in a group home. He's lived in a group home for the past six years. Again, I never heard of group homes. Um, it became difficult, you know, with myself and my two daughters, you know, managing, you know, my son, his needs is, you know, he's special and things change daily. Um, he's in a fabulous facility at this time. And um, working with Heidi and um, the staff, Alicia, um, David, um, editor, has been wonderful. Um, Dan, everybody, we come together as a team. I could have done it by myself. As a parent, you try to give what you can to your child. Me, I thought I was taking on the world and I could do it by myself. I can't tell you how much sorrow has meant to us and come aside to us and helped us. Um, again, with Anthony's needs changes and finding a group home that is a good fit for him has been a relief to me and the family. I'm able to go to work and not worry about a phone call that I have to leave immediately, which came often. Um, that I know that he's safe because he needs 24-7 care. At the group home, I know he's taking care of, um, to the level of my expectation, that he's showered and his teeth are brushed and um, that he's loved and cared for and he has grown relationships there with the staff. Sark is part of my team now. And I could have done it without Sark. I could not have done um, giving my son the resources that he needs. And I do worry, and I think parents do worry. Um, it's fine when they're young and they're in your care and they're in your home and um, you have more control. But when they get older, when I retire, when I'm gone, who's going to take care of my son? <coughs> Who's going to make sure that he has clothes that are not torn, that he's showered, that he has a meal? And now I know that I can rely on Spark, that they're going to be there. And I hope with the funding and the future of Spark, 
that not only my son, but other clients and consumers and their families can rest assured that Stark is here to stay. And they're going to be funded because we care about children with disabilities. They give so much back to us. They remind us of the innocence of life. We're busy. We get dressed. We put on our suits. We go to work. Um, I'm in human resources, so I deal with a lot of people all day long. But who's going to take care of those with special needs? My son reminds me of the innocence of life and of people, and there's good in people. I have drawings in my office from my son, and people come in my office, they ask me, you know, who drew that? And I'm very proud to say that my son did. I'm very proud of my son, of how far that he's come. He, he's, his laughter, his smile brings joy to so many people. He loves drawing anime. We go to anime every year. We look forward to next month. We're going to go to anime. He is contagious with that smile and that laughter. I am so proud of how far he's come with the help of Stark. And I, and I thank you all for coming and let me share a little bit about me and my son. And I ask that you remember me. You remember my son. You remember those that are looking for Sark's care. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. That was a really powerful testimony about you and your family. I have a couple more questions for you to ponder. I like questions, so you can tell. What does hope feel like? What does courage sound like? What does action look like? And how do things get better? Well, here's the answer to those four questions. Senator Bill Mani, Assemblymember Louis Alejo, and Assemblymember Mark Stone. Can we give them a round?
one of our responsibilities is to take our story and our narrative beyond our community, beyond our homes, beyond our families, to educate, to educate politicians and to educate our broader community um, that we indeed belong, that we are part of the strength, the background, the backbone, the vitality of our communities is the disabled community. And it comes in many shapes, in many sizes, with many different types of diagnoses and strategies and rehabilitation and living situations. But what we share in common is a vitality that we belong and that our lives count and are important. So the mantra of today uh, is a critical one. And it's a mantra that we will carry, Mark Stone and Luis Alejo and I will carry in Sacramento. But we continue to face tough times. And it's why the voice of this community is so critically important right now. I was elected in 2008. In the last four years, the state of California has had to cut 30 billion dollars from its budget. That's 30 billion with a B. No program has been spared from education to higher education to health care, disability services, and the, the funding for disability services has been dramatically cut, over one billion dollars over the last four years. So everyone in this room has had to stretch to accommodate those cuts. For some, it's meant fewer hours for in-home support service providers. For others, it's meant limited options in terms of uh, living facilities, medical support, rehabilitation support. We need to rally the voice that says cuts to the disability community should not be seen on par with cuts to freeway construction or building construction. We're talking about human beings and human lives. <laughs> Santi always leads off holding up the Lantern Act. Hold it up, Santi. Um, <laughs> this is more than a set of laws. It represents a civil rights act for people living with disabilities. And beyond people living with disabilities, we should see it also as a civil rights act for the provider community, without which we don't fulfill that obligation that is embedded in law. So as we work to implement the Lanterman Act, we implement it to create a caring community that provides uh, not only sufficient and adequate support for providers, but a living wage, as Heidi mentioned. These should be jobs that are jobs that have dignity, that have respect in our communities, and are held up on par with any other profession in this nation. Our The Lanterman Act is known by the name of one of its authors who was the champion for its establishment and who worked for years in the legislature to achieve it. There was a co-author of that bill named Nick Petrus, Nicholas Petrus from Oakland. Uh, Nick Petrus died a couple of weeks ago. He served a long career in the state legislature and he was also a champion for achieving and implementing uh, the Lanterman Petrus Act, and I just want us to acknowledge, uh, maybe not a moment of silence, but let's do a shout out for Nick Petrus. <laughs> we read in headlines of bipartisan gridlock, people won't compromise. As a Democrat, I have my own partisan views about what some of the problems are, and I don't think it resides in our party, but I'll try to not be partisan. <laughs> Support for the disabled community it is a bipartisan, ongoing work in progress. And similar to our respect for veterans' rights, I would say respect for the disability community is a bipartisan priority, and you will find a lot of bipartisan cooperation. But the challenges we face in this budget year, we, we have a better budget 
this year because voters did pass Proposition 30, which gives us a little breathing space, but we're not out of the woods. Uh, I have the honor of chairing the Senate uh, Budget Committee on Health and Human Services. We're taking testimony every week. Uh, two weeks ago it was on uh, regional centers. Santi Rogers was a, a member of an expert panel, and one of our commitments is this budget proposed by the governor moves forward is to remove um, the 1.25% cut to providers to sunset that cut and to restore that support for providers in the state of California. It's a move in the right direction, but I'm the first to recognize it's only a step in the right direction because it's bringing us back to a baseline that is too low. As the needs of our community grow, and as the needs of the provider community grow to keep pace uh, with cost of living and expensive places to live. So what we need to do as we move forward is to continue to encourage the lobby days. Your visits to Sacramento do make a difference. Legislators and our staffs do pay attention. And not just your visits to Sacramento, but your letters, your email, your faxes, giving voice to the legitimate and appropriate needs of our community is an absolute priority. And unfortunately, we have to be competitive with other interest groups that seek restoration of funding in their budgets, whether it's schools or health care providers and others. We need to remove these silos of people fighting for their piece of the budget. We need to join hands and articulate a vision of the communities we want to live in where everybody is created, treated with dignity and respect. And to do that requires sufficient funding. And if it means going back to how we build a budget and how we build a taxation system in this state, then we need to do it putting civil rights and human rights at the front of that equation. So I just want to conclude by again thanking all of you for the work that you do, for being the community and the people that you are. I want to especially acknowledge uh, my friends uh, Toby and Jared for their work on the video work. For this Toby and I are friends on Facebook, so we're in constant communication. <laughs> and I invite all of you to friend me on Facebook, because it is a forum where we can share information, share good news and sometimes bad news, but to support each other. So as we wrap up, and my good friends, uh, Luis Alejo and Mark Stone will be following, uh, we remember you but you must not ever allow us to forget you. And so your presence, your messages, they fortify us. You know, we go to a lot of events as legislators, and I will confess some feel like an obligation. This annual breakfast is not an obligation to us. It is where we come to gain inspiration, to fuel our batteries to work on your behalf in Sacramento, and I'd just like to close with a big thank you. We remember you. And let's do a union clap because this is a civil rights movement. Luis will join me. We're going to start slow and then we'll end fast. So Luis.
Good morning. Good morning. Gotta mix it up a little, little bilingual, but buenos dias. Yes. Everybody, thank you for inviting me to be here. I want to really thank my good friend, Bill Mine, and the previous speakers who were so inspirational, but more importantly, thank all of you for all the great work that you do day in and day out serving our communities. Uh, but I'm glad to be here with my good friends, uh, Bill Mine and Mark Stone. We're all good friends in Sacramento. We have a great relationship, so, which I always tell people, you could call us the three amigos, you know? <laughs> all, of us are, uh, all of us are attorneys. We all claim that we represent the best parts of California, but also all of us have dedicated a good part of our careers standing up for the most needy members of our communities, the people who have the, some of the greatest challenges, and we're very proud of the work that we've done. Um, I'm very proud to, to be here today as a member of the legislature. I grew up in my little hometown in Watsonville, down the street, and becoming mayor. My grandparents came to me as migrant farm workers, uh, pursuing the American dream. They wanted to come, work hard, uh, make an honest living, and provide a better future for their children. And because of that sacrifice, people like me are able to be now serving in this wonderful capital in Sacramento that many of you visited the other day. But that, with that comes an obligation too. Uh, that's why when I finished my schooling, um, my calling was to come back and work uh, representing uh, California Rural Legal Assistance, just like my friend Bill Monty did. Uh, Bill Monty used to be an attorney for the great legendary labor leader, Cesar Chavez. That's when he started his career. Uh, so I'm we're among great people here. But as a legal aid lawyer working in Monsimo, uh, many times um, parents would come to my office. They were uh, frustrated. Um, they were fighting the school issues because um, they wouldn't provide the, the needs for the kids with special needs. And so many times, they didn't have a representative. They were, they were fighting to give a good quality education to their children, uh, get them a good IEP plan, get them the, the needed services, and many times they always uh, found a closed door. So in many of those cases, we were able to stand up with those parents um, and, and fight for uh, special education services. And there was, I remember, one case that we won an administrative hearing, and uh, it was a kid who was falling through the cracks, the, the student, um, the school district just wanted to um, expel him from school. But once you looked at his cumulative um, file, you found out that there was other things going on there. Poor grades, not following in class. You know, he had um, learning disabilities. And so then we asked those uh, that uh, uh, independent evaluation to determine if there were special needs that were not being met by the school district. And of course, the school district hired a lot of attorneys. I had to fight it in federal court in San Jose, but thank God that the federal magistrate cited in our case um, in this case, to make sure that those kids get the services that they need. And a few years later, I was able to see his mom, she was a single mom, and uh, raising uh, two other children. And he was doing much better because he was getting the attention he needs. And those cases remind me that it was all worth it. When we're able to go get a good education, you make networks and experiences, but you come back home, and you help families solve these problems that were so frustrating. Sometimes that they felt they were so alone. But together, we were able to have a good resolution and bring justice to those families. So for me, that reminds me of that continued work, but now in a different capacity in Sacramento. So when I see a lot of um, families and disabled persons come fighting for a just budget, and uh, I remember Bill Monty was part of the Human Services budget last year, we were having to make some drastic cuts, but those hearings were packed from morning till night. Uh, people with disabilities from all over California, but it should have made a big difference. I mean, that, that image stayed in my mind but how important the work that you all do is, 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 uh, is for us to continue to support in Sacramento. And as a relatively younger legislator, um, I understand the critical importance of the Ladder Man Act of 1969 and the, how it set up these regional centers to provide the support, not only to the persons uh, with disabilities, but their entire families, so that there's, there's that support network and trained professionals who care and have a passion about working uh, and doing this work. Um, so in Sacramento, you know, there's, there's a lot of good issues going on. It's much better than it was the last years that I've been in Sacramento with the passing of Proposition 30, which for the first time we're going to have a balanced budget and a projected surplus over the next five years. But with that, we have the question now, what do we do with those additional funds? And certainly restoring some money in these critical services is going to be a key fight this year and the future years. And so one of those issues that I'm offering was a, was a bill, AB 900, and this issue started out in Hollister. Is anybody from Hollister? Got a few Hollister folks in the house. Well, Hazel Hawkins uh, took on this responsibility of having a skilled nursing facility. These are seniors with some serious abilities, uh, severe illness, and with the 10% in medical account cuts, they're looking actually at a 40, almost 45, 50% budget that if it's not restored, that center is going to close. And that allows um, their families to be close by. They get to go visit them on a regular basis. They have this great group of employees there. 
And so we're fighting to restore that money to keep that center open. And Hollister is another center in King City and B Memorial Hospital. But there's all these other centers in many other rural parts of California where these services are so critical. Uh, but then we started looking at what are the, the impact of the 10% uh, reduction in other uh, services, other providers for Medi-Cal. So we're now looking at a broader picture how we can restore all that money now that we have a different budget situation. So it's something that we're going to be committed to working on this year, and we'll hopefully we'll be able to get those services so that our families have the health care and the other services they need so they can have a, a healthy living as well. Um, this year I'm also fighting on another front. Uh, Assembly Bill 10, which is trying to raise the minimum wage in California. I mean, I, I'm gonna, I saw very recently, but I'm just saying if, if I had kids, it'd be almost impossible to pay my bills, provide for my families at eight bucks an hour, and it's been stuck there for six years now. You know, and, if, and, uh, and in those six years, the, pa the price of gas has gone up, the price of um, utilities and food and clothing, everything's gone up, so it makes it harder for most needy families in California to make a living. So this year, there's a lot of promise. We're getting much more support than it did the last two years um, that it didn't pass. But we're, we have a lot of um, uh, a lot of confidence that we're going to have a, a good shot at it this year. And then lastly, um, I got another bill that's trying to provide uh, additional consideration um, when we appoint judges, right? A lot of people who become attorneys, like Bill Monty and Mark Sloan, and um, we serve as lawyers for many years. But eventually, you got an opportunity to serve as a judge. But there isn't additional consideration right now given to either our veterans or persons with disabilities, and we're adding those as new criteria, new additional. Uh, consideration when you're planning to be a judge and you're a person who's lived your life with disabilities, you have that additional consideration because the bench, the judicial branch, should reflect the diversity of our community and we're fighting to make that a, a permanent reality here in California so that our judges are hopefully will be people who have who have lived this experience, or the challenges have this experience, so they can also have, understand that when they go to court, when you have people who really understand the particular needs of the disabled community and, and their families as well. But, but lastly, I, I just want to say thank you for inviting me here. Um, I, was, I was driving over here, I was wondering, it's San Andreas Regional Center. And so I remember, because my dad was an apostolic minister, so I grew up in church. My, my mom was a Sunday school teacher, did missionary work for five years in southern Texas for a while. And so I always remember San Andreas, St. Andrew was one of the apostles of Jesus. His brother was Peter. And this was, um, Jesus turned to them, to the disciples, the apostles, and asked them, Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And that was a special calling. Um, Jesus calling them to do special work, to do God's work. And that reminds me of the same kind of mission, the same calling for the people that work at San Andreas Regional Center. It's doing God's work and carrying on an important mission that really makes a tremendous difference in the lives of the people that you all serve. I want to say thank you very much. Thank you for always time for the challenge.
And if we all lend a hand and help each other and make sure that we have the safety net, the services together, things like the regional center, that we can reach our families and reach our children, then their outcomes are so much better. And they're so much more in a, an integral part of our communities. Now, I'm a new member of the legislature. And I'm also very honored, I'm not quite sure how it all happened, but I get to chair the Human Services Committee. So, I'm very, very grateful to the speaker for allowing me to do that. So the legislation that comes to the, well, the policy that comes to the legislature comes through the Assembly of Human Services Committee. And I get to have a say in that, and I am truly honored and thrilled to be able to do that. And I'll tell you, there was a bill that came through the Assembly of Human Services Committee just this week, and it was the Employment First Act. Right. Wes Chesbro, former senator, now assembly member, Employment First Act, which is a very, very important, significant piece of legislation. And it says that you have the absolute right to be a part of our workforce, as you should. Because everyone's lives are better when you're a part of the community out working with all the rest of us. And I'll tell you, even more importantly, all the rest of that workforce is so, their world and their lives are so much more enriched because you're there working side by side with them. So Employment First is this very, very important policy for California. And just look at Amy and Jared and, and Toby here to know how effective everybody can be and the great work that anybody can do if we let them and we must embrace all comers into our workforce that's a very significant act now others have mentioned the importance of staff and i'm going to put a shout out to my staff Paige Garahan here and maureen mccarty who's my district director and maisha jackson who's one of the human services staff up in sacramento we were called a number of months ago for a problem that was happening in San Jose, the Greater Opportunity Stay program was being closed. And it was being closed for arguably good reason, safety reason, and all of us are very, if we need to make sure and safeguard the safety of all of our people in our communities. But here are a bunch of folks in a day program, adults in a day program, who were having the doors closed around them and they didn't understand why. And they weren't given an opportunity to understand why or how it was happening. They had no place else to go. And my staff worked tirelessly and hard with the fire marshal, with community care licensing, and with the Greater Opportunities Program. And they're open. And they're open. They <laughs> have a chance to serve their community and all of their clients have a place to go now on a daily basis that they've been used to and going to for many, many years, and a real opportunity to fix the issues that had arisen, and they will. But most importantly, those clients now have a place to go and a place to be that is, is part of their daily life. And that is our responsibility to stand up, those of us in the legislature and the local government, those of us who get to run the programs, to stand up for the clients and the folks who need us to stand up for them and say, wait, we understand the bureaucratic need here, but is it right, and is it just, and is it fair? Is it fair to the communities that can't speak for themselves? That's our obligation. So, remember you? Yeah, I can't forget. <laughs> I want to thank you all for being here today, for being a part of this country contributing to the San Andreas Regional Center, and also for all those of you who came up to Sacramento. As a legislator, we're so far from home, I, I just cannot underscore how important it is to have folks from our district, people whom we recognize, come up and say hello and a chance to chat about how things are going in our beautiful Monterey Bay area. So thank you all very much. Let's give all of our speakers a big hand. No place like home. No place like home. You hear my hear my deal? No place like home. Leadership, leadership begins in each of the persons seated here. These great leaders, these incredible men, and the other men and women they serve with have an extraordinary challenge. We have a concentration of great heart and good minds 
in leading not only us as legislators, but two significant committees. A policy committee, you don't have to know about any of this stuff. It seems like mumble jumble when you hear it. A policy committee that talks about when is this idea of good law, and a budget committee. Holy cow. <laughs> Holy cow. They know what I'm talking about. And oh, oh, are we bonded for life? We were bonded when we first said hello to each of you. And now we're bonded for life. Um, we are available to you. We uh, like the message was carried here. Resonates, resonates that we can be remembered. But we have also an obligation, as you also have heard. We each have an obligation. You sent us, each of you sent the message to us. It's our responsibility. And never underestimate, never, never underestimate the power of one. Never underestimate the power of one. Wherever you get your enthusiasm, your belief, wherever you get your belief, it powers you to do it. You cannot, you cannot give up. This legacy of this great piece of civil rights has been mentioned. Of Lannerman, Mr. Lannerman, Mr. Petrus, and Mr. Short. Of the Lannerman, Petrus Short. I had the honor of knowing all three of those gentlemen. Mr. Short lived in Stockton. And it was from Stockton, and he was an incredible legislator. All of those men came from a great generation. And that great generation understood civil rights, and they got to witness it. The crossover away from some ideology and do the right thing, it was their capability. We have the same capacity, don't we? We absolutely have the same capacity. So what's missing here? Us, always fueling this great engine of great public policy. It's a never-ending story. And are you ready? I want to hear if you're ready to do that. Are you ready? Yes! yes. Are you ready? Yes! Are you really ready? Yes. On behalf of everyone here, our leadership of our volunteers, uh, of our uh, great board of directors, we're going to ask you another thing. If you're really ready, take a look at this really green piece of paper. It's not money, folks. And by the way, other than a few uh, dinners, most of the time you're rushed as you're eating them. Um, as a volunteer of a great volunteer service system, the Board of Directors of Regional Centers. You absolutely know somebody. You know somebody. They're probably right next door, or maybe in your own house, that you can provide this opportunity for service from our great diverse four counties of people. We need your help, and pass this on. Can you agree to help us with that? Please agree. We are looking for board members, always looking for board members. Believe it or not, um, every one of these legislators know me pretty well. I'm kind of wordy when it comes to things. I'm not a big fan of term limits. Uh, I'm committed for life. <laughs> and I know they aren't either. And the, problem, and the challenge is that these good laws are a result of legacy, of commitment, long-term commitment. And that's why persons like myself and hundreds of others will always remind you to the point of boredom. But here it is. This and this goes together, and I know that you can take this with you. Please don't leave any of these in the room. I'll watch. I'll watch. Uh, and look for somebody in offer them. Every time those have been the best board members, and there's great people volunteering, they're in the room, and they come back for more. Mr. Carroya is a great example of it. Extraordinary people as our board members, and he lives in Santa Cruz County, a great county. Um, that there is somebody else, there is somebody else who can carry on this legacy, and there are term limits, and that's what we want to advise you. Thank you again. Thank you to all the staff that helped do this. We really thank the resort for their greeting us, and most importantly, uh, this is another wonderful day. Uh, pray for all of our other Americans who are having challenges, and do this. Be safe. Enjoy yourself. Be safe.